Hi everyone, um, I'm Jessica, and today I'm just going to be sharing with you some current developments and some really cool new tools out there currently that may potentially help improve our KABI checking process. So, so KABI, kernel ABI, what exactly is it? So briefly defined, this is just the exported binary interface between the kernel and its modules. Um, at the highest level, um, we see this just as a list of exported symbols and their corresponding CRCs. But under the hood, um, it basically comprises of these unwritten sort of structural expectations, um, such as the expectations of certain symbols being available, like exported functions and variables. Um, there are also expectations of the layout of certain data types, and that would include such a um, that would include include the size of a type, for example, its alignment and um, offsets of different members in a structure, as an example. So, um, as a forewarning, um, the tools that are mentioned in this talk they handle these structural, they take care of these, checking these structural expectations and making sure that they're not violated. And they don't talk about the semantics or the behavior of certain code. Whenever you have a patch that modifies that, obviously that's going to always require a human reviewer to make sure that that doesn't endanger KBI stability. So why do we care about this at all? So primarily, this is only relevant to you know out of tree and third party modules. Um, in like an ideal world, all of these modules would be in tree and upstream, and I wouldn't have to give this talk. But sadly, that's not the world we live in. So yeah, we have to care about kernel ABI. Um, so I'm just going to go through like some common annoyances that we currently have in our sort of KABI checking process. So sometimes, I think everybody in this room probably already has dealt with this at some point or another, like handling um, false positive changes of symbol CRCs due to just shuffling of headers or adding a new include in a file that suddenly changes the CRCs of a bunch of symbols, for example. And we currently deal with this with just the, you know, the typical um, if def gen k sims hack. So, and then there are also we also deal with change CRCs due to type modifications, so changing a struct. And obviously these would cause um, the hash of a symbol to change, um, but usually the, if we know that that particular type is not of interest to external modules, then we could just hide that change from gen sims, and then that would just preserve the hash that it had in the first place. So. Um, that's another workaround that we have. And speaking of um, hiding changes from gen um, we also have an issue where we, are, we want to exclude certain symbols that shouldn't be considered in KBI checks when we know like that symbol is not used in any external modules or we know like that type is not going to be relevant to any external modules. So um, um, that, that's, that seems to be an issue that's come up several times in the past. So like we want to try to exclude symbols that are irrelevant to third party kernel, um, kernel modules. We know there are symbols that are also used in tree only that, uh, that's also not relevant in our KBI checks. Um, there are also symbols that are internal to a subsystem or internal to a driver, but exported to, we have, they have exported symbols in order to modularize that, um, modularize that subsystem. But those are also, um, shouldn't be considered under KABI checks. Um, I think some distributions, like Red Hat, for example, I think they provide like a KBI whitelist of symbols. So like they have a list of symbols that, these are the symbols that we will guarantee KBI stability on, but correct me if I'm wrong or not, but I'm not, I don't think that's the case for us. Like we kind of blanketly say like, we will support all exported symbols, and then we kind of, on a case-by-case -case basis, exclude symbols from the KABI checks. So, so um, are there ways to sort of make this more manageable? So um, there's been a patch set um, that's been submitted recently, I think like a month or two ago, um, that deals with sort of namespacing these exported symbols. So as of the 417 kernel, for example, we have over you know, 30,000 exported symbols and there's like no way that we're going to you know, have to 
guarantee KBI stability for all these symbols because they're not all relevant to us or not relevant to third party modules. So from a distributor's perspective, definitely not all of them have to be considered under KBI. So um, Martin Conan, I'm not sure if I pronounced his name correctly. Um, he submitted a patch set recently um, that introduces namespacing to exported symbols. And I think that this feature, having this feature upstream would make this more manageable. So his, his patch set basically allows you to, or allows developers to partition or group symbols according to namespaces. So subsystem maintainers can partition their exported symbols and module authors would just simply have to import the namespaces they want in order to access the exported symbols that belong to that namespace. So in this patch set, he introduces several new macros. So we have like export symbol NS and module import NS. So the export macros, they work exactly the same way as the normal exports. Um, macros, um, but in this case, we add a little tag at the end that specifies what namespace that symbol should belong to. So I just have an example here. If we want to, for example, namespace the live patching symbols, then we could export them into a live patch namespace. And similarly for module import NS, if a kernel module would like to use symbols from the live patching namespace, then that module would have to include module import and S, and then the name of the namespace, which would be live patch in this example. So, so the current implementation, so the patch that's currently at version one, and I'm not gonna go into the details because I think version one is gonna differ a lot from version two, but basically like the main concept here is that every exported symbol now would get an extra namespace tag, and this is represented as a string currently, and null would mean that that symbol has, doesn't belong to any particular namespace. And um, modules would then have a list of namespaces that they import. So at module load time, at symbol resolution time, the usage of exported symbols are then cross-checked against the list of namespaces that that module imports. And um, the module loader and mod posts, currently in this version, it just warns if a module uses an exported symbol um, who belongs to a namespace that it doesn't import. Um, so like this is a pretty lenient policy right now, but it could be trivially made to, you know, fail the module loader, fail the module build if um, the module doesn't import the namespace it's using symbols from, so. So like, how is any of this related to KABI at all? Um, I think this patch set would be able to, you know, sort of declutter and sort of impose order or pre present a more clearly defined kernel interface for modules. Um, we could, we would have the ability to cleanly group symbols that should or shouldn't be considered part of the KABI. So for example, if we have namespaces today and it's upstream and we have namespaces listed in the module simverse file, for example, we could easily include or exclude them from our KBI checks. So instead of, um, I think everybody in this room is familiar with the severities file. So like instead of listing symbols or listing files or path wildcards, we could easily just control groups of symbols with their respective namespaces. So. Um, for example, we have this entry in the severities file that refers to live patching symbols. So like we kind of list wildcards of what symbols that should be excluded or be exceptions to like the KBI checks. We could just go from listing them into just specifying like what namespace to exclude symbols from the ABI checks from. So I think that would be a pretty cool improvement to our process. So. Um, yeah, switching gears. So we're gonna switch from kernel space improvements to sort of user space now. So um, there have been some pretty cool new tools developed really recently. One in particular is a framework called libabigail. Um, so libabigail is a library developed by Doji Secatelli from Red Hat. Um, this framework allows you to perform a static analysis of ELF binaries and compare their ABIs. Um, one thing to note though is that this framework would require debug information to be included into the binary in order for libabigail to have enough information to provide, uh, to perform the analysis and the diffs. So um, 
libabigail-based tools such as ABI diff, which I'm going to show a little bit later, um, these tools could potentially provide developers with more textual reports about ABI changes. So um, right now what we currently have is that you just see, you have a CRC and you see it change, but you have no idea what exactly caused that KABI breakage and you could spend like a lot of time trying to chase down what change to a struct that I made that caused that CRC to change and that's really annoying and wastes a lot of time. So what libabigail could do is basically identify exactly what caused a KABI breakage. It, it can identify like the, the source code changes that you made that introduced the ABI change. So I think this is a really promising tool. Um, and I'll do a couple of demos of that a little bit later. So yeah. So um, some exciting news. So libabigail was originally developed to uh, detect ABI changes of like user space packages. So very recently, just last year, the maintainer has um, basically introduced uh, Linux kernel support into libabigail. So this was just introduced last year, I believe. Um, so now libabigail based tools like ABI diff, are, these tools are now able to understand how symbols are exported in the Linux kernel. They're, like when, when you give ABI diff, for example, a VM Linux binary, then it will only look at the symbols under the KSIM tab sections. So it knows how to read the special ELF format that the VM Linux binary is in. So um, I just have a short list of libabigail-based tools that I've found so far to be pretty useful. So there's ABI diff, which I've mentioned several times. Um, basically, this tool provides a diff report of two binaries that you give it. Um, and there is also KMI diff, which is pretty similar to ABI diff, but then this tool actually works with the whole Linux kernel tree. So it basically works on the union of exported symbols from VM Linux and all of the modules. So you can give it two different trees and it will compare all of the, the both of all of those binaries. So, and provide a pretty detailed report on the differences. And then lastly, there's also ABI DW. So this tool is able to sort of serialize and produce a textual representation of an, the ABI of a binary. So um, in ABI speak, this is, it produces an ABI XML format. Um, it also understands the Linux kernel tree. So you can also give it the Linux kernel option. Um, that was a pretty recent addition. Um, this tool is pretty useful because I think you could, I mean, you could use it to create sort of like a baseline ABI specification that you could use to compare with maybe another ABI specification or compare it to another binary. Um, so this is pretty analogous to what we have now as our reference modules inverse and symbol references files. So. And yeah, like I mentioned before, ABI diff um, is able to read these XML files produced by ABI DW, so you could read back the ABI specification and compare that to maybe another ABI specification or compare it to another binary. So these are all, I think, pretty useful tools. So like just to provide some background on how libabigail works. So I'm not a libabigail developer. I haven't really looked too deeply into the source code. So this is the 10,000 feet view of how it works. So libabigail, as far as I know, it reads, it works with elf and dwarf information from binary. So it reads all of that in. And from that information, it builds like an internal model or internal representation of all the symbols, all the types and declarations of these binaries. And then it, so it produces basically graphs, and then it compares these two graphs of ABI artifacts. And then from that, it produces the diff report. So yeah, it builds an internal representation of what has changed. So like these changes are typically like, oh, this function got removed, or this variable got added, and stuff like that. And um, it could, would also report like if you've modified you know, types, and you change structs and functions, signatures, and so on. Okay, so I'm just going to show really quickly how what these what these tools look like in action, if I can get this to work. Okay, cool. I hope that's visible to people. Okay. So right now I'm I'm in the 
clean Linux tree. There's no modifications here. Um, the version doesn't really matter, but it's, you know, 8.4.18 RC1, so it's a little bit outdated, but that doesn't matter. Um, so we are going to try out ABI diff, and we're going to produce an ABI change. So let's just take live patching as an example, since it's pretty self-contained. So let's introduce, wait, let's see. Let's go into, let's see what kind of exported functions live patching has. So like, for example, we have KLP enable patch, KLP disable patch, KLP red, um, register patch, and so on. So like all of these functions, exported functions from live patch, take a structure named KLP patch. So we're going to change that structure, modify it, and see what ABI diff says in its report. So let's modify the KLP patch struct. So yeah, hopefully everybody could see that. So that's struct KLP patch. I'm just going to insert a new member in the struct just to see what um, libabigail says. So let's do a new field. So this is in the middle of the struct. So obviously this would be problematic. It would change the offsets of all of the fields below it and change the size of the struct as well. So, okay. So we made that modification. So let's just compile that. I know, I was just literally, <laughs> I was like, I need tiny CC right now. <laughs> oh, that's the question though, yeah. We need that informa dwarf information, yeah. Yep. That, no, it could, it could use external debug info as far as I know, yep. This is taking a lot longer than I thought it would. <laughs> I didn't know so many binaries include or objects included live patch dot h, but okay, yeah, that makes sense. Scheduler stuff. Come on. Okay, so we have our VM Linux binary with our changes. So let's go look. So before this presentation, I already compiled a clean VM, VM Linux binary without any modifications. So that's VM Linux dash one, that's somewhere in this directory. And then we have our new VM Linux binary. I'm just going to call it VM Linux two. And then we have our ABI diff tool. And I'm just going to enable the verbose option so you could kind of see what it's doing under the hood. So if I supply it with VM Linux 1 versus VM Linux 2 with our modifications, let's see. So here, libabigail, you see that, oh, it's kind of cut off. Damn it. It's building the internal representation of VM Linux 1. You can see it's looking at all of those types that are found in the binary. So, and now it's building the representation for VM Linux 2. And then it will do the comparisons after that. So this should hopefully produce a report. I mean, I tested it before the presentation, so. <laughs> okay, things didn't break. Anyway, so this is the resulting report from ABI diff. So you see here, 
it found some function changes, or just one function change, and it says here. So it noticed that there's something that changed with KLP disable fetch, and it gives you, you know, the file name and the line number, and it says, hey, there are some indirect subtype changes. So I noticed that parameter, the first parameter, KL, um, has some subtype changes. So like the pointed to type KLP patch, it had a data member insertion, which is exactly what I did before. And it even tells you like which data member was problematic. So it's like, hey, you inserted an unsigned int called new field, and you, and now this is at offset, blah, blah, blah. And it shows you um, like the header file where you made this change. So, and it also shows you there are also um, four other data member changes. So it shows you like, hey, all of these members, their offsets also changed. And it shows you the changed offsets and how by how many bits it shifted. So that's pretty useful. Um, one thing I need to note though is that, um, so by default, um, ABI diff suppresses reporting of redundant changes. So you might have noticed, or if you looked at the live patch code, you know that there are way more exported functions that work with the KLP patch struct, yet they were not reported here. And that is because ABI diff by default suppresses, like I said, redundant changes. So like all of those functions changed as well, but they all had the same change. And it was the struct KLP patch that had changed. So libabigal saw that and said, okay, I don't need to report that again because it's the same change. So now you've, we, were, we were able to identify you know, exactly what changed or what caused the ABI breakage with like the source code and the, the file names and line numbers and everything. So. I think this is a huge improvement by just looking at change CRCs. Um, I think there was another, ah, okay. So libabigail has this really cool feature called suppression. So this is basically the equivalent of our severities file, I think. So like, for example, if we don't care about ABI changes to the live patching sim exported symbols, for example, because they're not relevant to external modules, then we could tell uh, ABI diff that we don't want to see reporting on any of those symbols. So um, to do that, we would simply supply ABI diff with a suppression specification. So, I mean, I just wrote a very simple one. Um, so like there's a whole manual page on suppression specifications and I'm not going to go into that, but basically this enables, there are like, um, clauses that enable you to, I don't want to see changes related to this type. I don't want to see changes related to this function and stuff like that. Or I don't want to see changes related to the size of a struct um, expanding and stuff like that. So here I just basically have, I don't want to see suppressed type means that I'm suppressing uh, reports related to this particular type. And I'm giving it a regular expression. So like this name regex variable. So I'm basically, um, don't want to see any reports on any symbols that start with KLP. So if I pass it, um, uh, let's see, I think it's, I can pass the suppression specification as an argument to the supper flag. So it's supper.api, and then we can run this again. And this time it should not report any KABI breakage. Hello. Oh, okay. Uh, so I have two questions. One of them is, uh, the first one is, uh, uh, does this support uh, static inlines defined in, in header files? I mean, if you Static just... inlines, okay. The thing is that that would, inlines would probably be a problem because then, oh, they have to be emitted as a symbol for it to be seen, but yes. then, yeah. So it hooks into exported symbols. Right, okay, We right. cannot deal with those right now anyway, but, uh, Let's say that you have a structure that 
that you change and uh, uh, it would probably and it's used okay, so somewhere in an inline thing. Probably not supported. And the other one yeah. is, have you tried to compare, for example, some of our slick kernel, like uh, GA versus some maintenance update, just to see what's the output of this thing? Oh, uh, no, I have not tried that. That would have been a really good demo. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, I haven't tried that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one typical pattern that we deal with often is that if you have a structure which is never embedded structure, never used as a member of an array, and is always supposed to be allocated by some helper, internal helper, then you don't really care about adding fields at the end. So is the language of the suppression? No, yes, you c exactly. So you could specify in the um, suppression specification that for this particular type, I don't care if you add new fields to it. And then it would not show any reporting of those. Yeah, so it's pretty flexible on how what you can specify as a suppression. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. So it finished in the meantime, and it said, "Oh." So, okay, um, to my understanding, it's a binary ABI, so that pre-compiled modules continue to be loaded. Is that correct? Yeah, but they, they might not necessarily work. Yeah. No, 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 no. So, so pre-compiled modules, so the modules are in binary form, right? Yeah. Are you with me so far? Good. Where exactly does the header file come into? Uh, change, change if, you, yeah, if you change, yeah, but, okay, just let me give you a... Let me give you a simple example. Uh, let's say you have a static inline to helper to basically tell that page table is dirty. And if you change the bit that represents the dirty bit, then the old modules compiled against the previous implementation of the helper will think about, will have completely different idea what the dirty bit means, which is not true anymore. So you have broken ABI. Silently. Silently. But you change the meaning of a flag, not the not the inline function. You change the meaning of the flag. Uh, might be more complicated. It might be more complicated. Uh, check or we we've, we've had that happen like three weeks ago with the lazy slash eager fq implementation, where we had actually a static inline on lazy fq, which did mark the view as lazy and started switching. And all the modules that have been compiled against the old kernel had to a different implementation of the other API in line to them, so it broke completely. And if we ask the check of like def like in the case of static inlines, that's I don't think that would be caught by this tool because first of all it ABI diff is going to be working or looking at only symbols that are in the case sim tab sections. So it's not going to, and also like I, those inlines are not going to be emitted as symbols. So it's that's yeah, yeah. That's not a regression, obviously. But uh, what I would be a little bit worried about, if we are let let's say that we hypothesize that uh, this new tool is going to uh, replace what uh, we have right now. So the only thing that I that wouldn't be uh, called properly is when we have data structures, which are commonly accessed by modules but only through inlines. Let's say like mmstruct or okay. uh, mmstruct is a bad example because that's most probably some kind of function that is exported and takes it as an argument. But uh, if you have only an inline access, uh, static inline access uh, data structure, then you wouldn't catch the change of the data, data structure because there is no common access point to it. And 
And would we catch it now? That's what I, I was wondering. We if we... Because if I remember correctly from uh, what Michal Marek told me some time ago, uh, current KABI checker actually starts with a list of exported symbols and checks structures which are either directly or indirectly used by some of them. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. It's it's exactly the thing. Uh, it takes the exported symbols and uh, expands everything recursively to the down to the uh, basic types. Like, yeah. If yeah, or or a struct which is not defined at that point. Yes, so you can have incomplete types as well. Um, but yeah, in, it, it it expands recursively, and uh, that's all it does. If you have um, if you have a structure which is not used by any of the exported symbols, then it does nothing. Which I think is exactly what this tool does, but this tool imposes it in a much nicer way. Right. And more reasonably because it works on health and not the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you wouldn't have that problem of having incomplete types because the expansion trees would also would always be complete because we're holistically looking at the binary. So we have all the information that we would need to create those kinds of trees. Yeah, yeah that's an improvement. So if you, if, because what happens now sometimes is that you add an include into a file which uh, defines a type which was previously incomplete right. and it changes. Yeah, exactly. It confuses the, the yeah. checker. So, so yes, there is some improvement. Yeah. So definitely, like this kind of these kinds of tools would get rid of false positive changes, exactly like what you described. So, yeah. Okay, wait. Uh, getting. How are we doing on time? I forgot when this talk ends. I think I have fifteen minutes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh shoot. <laughs> I was gonna show another. Okay, another tool. AVIDW was what I had uh, mentioned before, and this was the tool that sort of serializes and emits a ABI representation in a text file format. Um, so I can just show that very quickly, I think, hopefully. So see, I just want to serialize the ABI for VM Linux and just see what that, just to show you guys what this kind of file would look like. Um, Should be running. Okay, so these types of ABI XML files, they're known in libabigail as the ABI corpus. So you could use, potentially use these files and provide like baselines of an ABI for a certain kernel version, for example. So here, um, I don't know if you get this pretty small to see, but anyways, you could see we can go back to our KLP patch example and you could see what it looks like in the ABI corpus. So like here we see like we have a struct named KLP patch and this is the size of the struct um, and it has the following data members so that the corpus would list all of the members and their types and so on. And we can also look at the function declaration. So I think register patch was one. We looked at so in the corpus, this KLP register patch is represented as a function declaration node in the ABI corpus, um, and then it shows you there's a bunch of information like the file path of where that symbol stemmed from, the line number, etc., um, the size and the parameters too. So you can see like this function has one parameter, and this is the type it's associated with, and the name of the parameter, and so on. So. That's what ABI XML looks like. And like I said, it's pretty useful because you could have a baseline ABI corpus and compare it with newly, uh, freshly compiled binaries or compare it with another ABI baseline. So it's a pretty useful tool. So I think that's it with the demos. So another problem that this, um, that libabgo doesn't really solve or it has to solve because it's not relevant is having KBI checks at runtime. So we currently accomplish this by using mod versions. So we do mod version checks at module load time. 
So we accomplish this with CRC comparison. So we look at a list of expected CRCs and we compare those to the CRCs of the symbols provided by the running kernel and then reject the module if the CRC doesn't match. Um, so an idea that's been floating around is that maybe we can create a Gen K Sims replacement based on libabigail that would provide more reliable hashes on symbols than Gen K Sims could because we have those limitations where we have incomplete expansion trees and then we get a bunch of false positives and stuff like that. And, that, and these limitations would not affect libabigail. So we've been floating around this idea and we're gonna call this theoretical tool LK hash for now. Um, so like some ideas on implementing such a tool. Um, so luckily libabigail already provides a walker API for traversing the graphs it creates when reading in a binary. So you could very trivially, trivially walk this graph of types and functions and variables in the binary. So what you could do is have, if you have a list of exported symbols, you could walk the tree of those exported symbols and accumulate the hashes of all of its subtypes. So that includes like all of the parameters, return type, et cetera, and all the subtypes underneath those parameters. So we were floating around this idea and we're like, what about upstream? There's no way upstream is gonna take like a thousand, like several thousand line C++ library. So, <laughs> um, so one idea was that maybe we could have a new configuration option that would allow the user to supply our own hashes or our own CSC. So like we could supply our own libabigail generated hashes instead of the Gen Kasim supplied ones. So this is all still in a very early discussion sort of phase. So now the next the question, now the next step would be to actually implement all of this and see how well all of that works together. Um, all right, so some caveats. I hope I have, do I have time still? Okay, maybe five minutes. Um, so some caveats with our theoretical LK hash tool. So like currently with our Gen K Sims approach, it's very trivial for us to hide changes from Gen K Sims in order to produce the same hash that we had before as our reference symbol. So if we have this libabigail based LK hash tool, like that's not going to be very easy to hide such changes from our theoretical LK hash tool. Um, since Gen K Sims works on a sort of, e on each pre-processed file, so then it's very easy to hide your modifications to a struct, for example. But then since libabigail works on the binary holistically, it's going to be very difficult to hide such changes from the hashing library. So um, this is an unsolved problem. Like we, we still need a way to tell libabigail that I want to keep the same hash that I had before or um, to hide certain changes from it or maybe annotate, um, like I don't want these fields to be included or I don't want these types to be included in the final hash calculation, for example. So this is still um, an obstacle that needs to be addressed. Um, and then suppressions. Oh yeah, I already talked about suppressions of specifications and I showed you guys an example. Um, okay. So I think that's, okay. So just as a summary of where things are now. So as far as the exported symbol namespaces patch set, I'm, I'm pretty sure version two is being worked on. I'm not sure when that's going to be submitted, but I'm hoping really soon. Um, there's um, still, I still need to implement the LK hash prototype or finish implementing it and then figure out how on earth we're going to incorporate this into the K-Build system, if it even should. And also finally, um, working on just general um, ABI, KMI, diff testing and improvements. Um, since this is a really, really new tool, um, I would encourage people that are actually interested in this to help test out because the Linux kernel feature added into these tools is very, very new. So like we, we need more people getting in on this. Um, for example, I just recently found that, you know, libabigo doesn't deal with detecting export symbol type changes. So if one symbol is export symbol and a, and a change to export symbol GPL, for example, then the libabigo doesn't detect that, but that should be trivial to implement. So just catching small things like that. So, um, and if you guys, you know, have comments or ideas on libabigo in general, um, the maintainers are always hanging around 
on the LibAbago channel on OFTC, so feel free to join. And then I provided a link to all the documentation. So, yep. And I think that's it. And I think I'm out of, oh no, I have five minutes. Cool. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm.